It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, journalists at the Toronto Star are investigating a controversial government program that has caused many Ontarians to unnecessarily lose their driver's licenses and their livelihoods. Public servants prepare detailed answers to reporters' questions, but according to records uncovered by Freedom of Information, the offices of the Premier and of the Minister of Transportation blocked them from going out. 35 questions. Should have had 35 answers. But your government muzzled staff on every answer. So my question is to the Premier. Why did the Premier and the Transport Minister try to keep this information from the public? To apply for the government, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for her question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's roads are among the safest anywhere in North America, and mandatory reporting for physicians an optometrist has been in place in this province since 1968. The Ministry of Transportation oversees a rigorous process that adheres to national medical standards, and Ontario's program is closely aligned with that of other provinces. Mr. Speaker, multiple statements were provided to the reporter, including an in-depth briefing with subject matter experts from the Ministry of Transportation on the driver medical reporting program. Now, Mr. Speaker, the goal of the program is to protect publics, the public from individuals who have a medical condition that makes it unsafe for them to drive. We are continuing to review all programs within the Ministry Spons. of Transportation to make sure that our roads remain the safest in North America. A supplementary question. Again, Speaker, 35 questions, not one answer. Yeah. And every indication that this government muzzled civil servants. Speaker, this is not the first time this government has interfered in the work of the independent public service. In fact, just last month, the Premier and this same minister were caught withholding important information about public transportation projects from the public. Speaker, I agree with Democracy Watch. This is the kind of dangerous, undemocratic secrecy that covers up wrongdoing and abuse and prevents problems from being solved. So again, Speaker, back to the Premier. What exactly was his office trying to hide? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to repeat the response that I gave previously. Mr. Speaker, Order. multiple statements were given to the reporter in question, including an in-depth briefing by Ministry of Transportation officials. On the, on the program itself to answer their questions directly. Oh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to the building of the largest public transit infrastructure program anywhere in North America, Metrolinx has been working closely with community groups and with affected stakeholders. Over a hundred meetings were held with City of Toronto officials since the beginning of the program, since City, of Coun since City Council itself voted in favour of our subway program. Over 30 me me meetings Response. were held with a specific member of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, to discuss her, their concerns about issues that are affecting their community members. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to work closely with the city and with members. Thank you. The final supplementary. Nothing to see here, eh? Nothing to see. Speaker, more than 280,000 Ontarians had their licenses revoked for apparently medical reasons over 10 years. Ontarians deserve a government that they can trust. They deserve a government that's straight up with them. But instead, they're getting this pattern of secretive behaviour, questionable deals with insider developers on the Greenbelt, secret mandate letters, mysterious contingency funds, sneaky minister zoning orders, and now they're squashing information and the facts about this licensing program. Order. Speaker, if the Premier has nothing to hide, why won't he be transparent with the people of this province? Yeah. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I hate to disappoint the Leader of the Opposition, who clearly wants to construct a narrative that has nothing to do with the facts themselves, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, our government published a study in conjunction with the University of South Wales and Sunnybrook Health Centre. That study looked at the medical reporting program in Ontario over a 10-year period and found that our program was effective 
and it saved lives across the province, Mr. Speaker. That is the purpose of the program. As I have said, we have met, we have provided multiple uh, statements to the reporter in question, including an in-depth briefing that that reporter participated in to pose his questions directly to, to subject matter experts. Mr. Speaker, Spons. we're going to continue to evaluate the program to make sure that it meets the needs of Ontarians and keeps our roads as safe as they've been among the safest anywhere in North America. Order. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. No answers from this government. No transparency. Thank goodness we have some accountability because this morning the patient ombudsman released their annual report. They received more than 3,000 complaints last year with one common theme, a lack of staffing and a lack of access to care. Hospitals are struggling under this government's staffing crisis, and worse, the ombudsman is warning that this government's expensive, ideological push toward two-tier health care is only going to prolong this issue. So my question is to the Premier, will you stop taking nurses to court, get the lights back on in public operating rooms, and get Ontarians the health care they need? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Mr. Speaker, and first of all, I'd like to thank the patient ombudsman. You know, since the uh, office of the patient ombudsman has been in existence, they've been a val valuable tool to assess where we need to make improvements. There is no doubt that the investments that we have made in terms of Learn and Stay program, colleges and universities, to allow nurses, uh, lab technicians, and and paramedics in Northern Ontario to be able to have their tuition and books covered, is making a difference in terms terms of our uh, ensuring that we have sufficient health human resources. You know, I, I have to point out a very successful uh, partnership that we have with the College of Nurses Order. of Ontario, where in the summer we directed them to ensure that individuals who are internationally educated Response. had their applications assessed and ultimately approved and licensed in the province of Ontario. Historic, 7,000 new nurses in the province of Ontario are practicing today that wouldn't have been there without that work. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. But more are leaving every day. Yeah. Right? More are leaving every day, so you can't keep up. Anybody who's had any experiences in the health care system over the last few years Order. knows this. Speaker, it gets worse. Yesterday, Order. we heard from experts in the Ministry of Health and the Ontario and Ontario Health at Public Accounts Committee. They acknowledged that the lights are off in pu public hospital operating rooms while this government hands million-dollar contracts to for-profit clinics. And as our health critic asked multiple times yesterday, I want to also ask the Premier, why are you denying public hospitals the opportunity you're giving to for-profit companies for additional surgeries and diagnostic yeah. imaging? Order. And the Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, I will give the facts, sheer facts. Since 2018, Order. Mr. Speaker, over 60,000 60, nurses, 8,000 new doctors registered here in Ontario, more than ever in the history of our province. And the fact is, and I want to thank the, the colleges of, of nurses for bringing on 12,000 new nurses last year, as they said, not us. That was a record. But even better, Mr. Speaker, we have 30,000 nurses in our colleges and universities being trained to get into the field. That's what we're doing. And the final supplementary. Again, it feels like the twilight zone in here. I just, I don't know where this premier and who he's talking to, Order. but he isn't Order. talking to Ontarians. We're not talking to Ontarians. This is not the reality of what's happening out there. The thing is, Speaker, this government's plan, this two-tier plan, is unnecessary, it's time-consuming, and it's totally wasteful. We already have the infrastructure we need to shorten the wait times. But because of this government's staffing crisis, one-third of Ontario's operating rooms aren't running at full capacity. Speaker, to the Premier again. Will this government fund public hospitals to properly use existing OR space instead of giving those funds to for-profit clinics? Minister of Health. Speaker, with the greatest of respect, we have and we are. Since the pandemic, $8 million has been available 
to hospitals across Ontario to ensure that they can ramp up ORs when they have capacity. Eight million dollars. In last year alone, we spent three. We offered hospitals the opportunity to expand their OR by over three three hundred million dollars. We've made those expansions, and our hospital partners have truly stepped up. But we are not stopping there because this is not an either or. This is an and. We can also expand our community surgical, and we've done that in Windsor, in Kitchener Waterloo, and in Ottawa through the expansion of existing infrastructure in community uh, care that, it, that is now allowing Spons? more people accessing cataract surgery. We're getting the work done. Yeah. The next question, the member for Ottawa West, McKeon. Thank you, Speaker. While our kids are struggling without adequate supports, teachers and education workers are burning out from working short-staffed, and our school boards are so underfunded that they're talking about closing schools, this government is not even spending the funds they promised to. The Financial Accountability Office reported last week that the government has underspent on schools by $432 million so far this year. Just think how many schools $432 million could keep open, or how many EAs that could pay for. Why is this government failing to invest in our kids? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are investing an additional $680 million this school year alone because we are committed to helping kids catch up after a global pandemic that has sent so many children back in this province around the world. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to mental health, we've increased funding by 400 per cent, $90 million. For special education, that funding is up to the highest levels in the history of Ontario at $3.2 billion. $90 million more. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to building schools, we have a $14 billion capital commitment over the next decade to build, modernize, and re renew our publicly funded schools after a decade of darkness under the former Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to invest in each and every budget to get these kids back on track. Supplementary question. You're not actually investing if the money doesn't actually get out the door. That's right. That's right. Let's put this underfunding in concrete terms, Speaker. The Toronto District School Board is in a precarious financial situation because, like many school boards, they were forced to pay $70 million out of their own reserves for the government's COVID measures. You heard that right. Despite the government having billions in unspent COVID relief funds, they made underfunded local school boards foot the bill. Now, with their reserves depleted and not enough funding from this government, the TDSB is looking at cutting 485.5 staff positions in order to balance their budget. 485 teachers, EAs, child and youth workers, ECEs, and custodians gone when kids are already not getting the help they need. Will the Minister of Education commit today to repaying school boards for their COVID expenditures Question. and giving them the resources they need to provide kids with more supports, not less? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, if the members of the opposition were so committed to increase staffing in schools, they would not have opposed 7,000 additional staff hired in the province by this progressive conservative government. That is your record systematically opposing investments in publicly funded schools to hire more psychologists, more psychotherapists, more educators, EAs and ECs. That is the record of Order. the NDP and the Liberal Party under this party, under our Premier. We are investing in more staffing, in more resources, in a tutoring program that never existed in this country, the largest ever, $175 million to allow hundreds of thousands of kids to get small group tutoring. Mr. Speaker, we expanded investments because we know we need to lift the standards when it comes to reading, writing and math, getting back to the basics, helping these kids succeed. Response. We will continue in every single year, continue to increase the investments in our children. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ontario is home to the largest life sciences sector in Canada, which employs thousands of workers in high-skilled jobs. But with competition growing south of the border and in other parts of the world, we need to remain competitive 
if we're going to continue attracting these important and critical investments. Speaker, will the minister please tell us how the government plans to promote the province as a place where global companies and entrepreneurs choose to invest and ensure that services offered and products made here in Ontario benefit Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, last week we were thrilled to welcome Novartis as they opened a brand new office in downtown Toronto. There are now more than 150 Ontario employees working for Novartis, including 50 in that brand new state of the art office in the Mars Building. This investment from Novartis is creating more well paying, high skilled jobs while strengthening Ontario's world class. Uh, life sciences sector. This comes on the heels, Speaker, last week's announcement from AstraZeneca, who are creating 500 well-paying jobs at their Canadian R&D hub in Mississauga. These back-to-back -back investments in Ontario are a vote of confidence for our thriving life sciences sector. And Speaker, Spons? it is a strong signal to the rest of the world that Ontario is the best place to invest and grow. On the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. There is no doubt that Ontario's booming life sciences sector has contributed to the province's economic prosperity. But in order to continue attracting game-changing investments, Ontario needs to demonstrate that it is able to compete with other jurisdictions and show that we are open for business. Speaker, will the minister please share how this government is ensuring that Ontario is a top-tier global jurisdiction for life sciences innovation? Mr. Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. Under the previous government, Ontario was unable to compete for investments in the life sciences sector, leaving our hands tied and reliant on other jurisdictions for critical medicines. That's why we released the province's first life sciences strategy in more than a decade, and it includes a $15 million life sciences innovation <coughs> fund with other important commitments to the industry. Speaker, we have attracted nearly $3 billion in life sciences in investments in just the last 24 months. That puts 70,000 skilled employees working in more than 1,900 life sciences firms because Ontario has the formula for success and everything global companies need to survive and to thrive. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. My question is for the Premier. Power, they have talked a whole lot about the overcrowding problems in our hospital. Unfortunately, last week in Collingwood, a 32-year-old father was seriously injured at work. It took almost eight long hours until they were able to find a hospital with a vacant ICU bed to meet his needs. What does the government have to say to families who are victims of the overcrowding problem they promised to fix five years ago? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when I uh, heard about that story, devastating news for the family and the uh, friends of that individual. But I want to be clear. That was not as a result of hospital capacity issues. That was as a result of someone who was going to a hospital that needed a much higher level of care. So now, if we look at the investments that our government is making, over 50 new capital projects in our hospital systems, new hospitals in Brampton, new hospitals in Windsor, in Ottawa, um, in Niagara, we are investing to ensure that hospitals have the expansion plans, and we've done that through, again, 50 different capital builds that are now occurring. Response. Supplementary. Speaker, the health care crisis in our hospital is real. The overcrowding crisis in our hospital is also real. It has a direct impact on the quality and the timeliness of care that is available to people. This time, the consequences are a dead worker, a young widow, 
and a fatherless two-year-old son? How many more families will be broken before the government addresses the health care workers' crisis in our overcrowded hospitals? And the Minister of Health. So again, Speaker, I reinforce how devastating that news is to that family, those friends, that community. But I also want to offer some hope to the people of Ontario that we have 50 new hospital builds that are happening in the province of Ontario, whether those are brand new facilities, expansions, or additions. It speaks to the fact that we as a government are making that commitment and ensuring that when people need care, it is available in their own community. For that individual and that family, uh, absolutely devastating, without a doubt. But the care that was needed and necessary for that individual was in another hospital, and they were being taken, of course, by Aaron Orange when, of co when unfortunately, he succumbed to his injuries. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Here, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ontario's agri-food sector is vital to the economic success of our province, yet high costs of inputs, supply chain challenges, inflation, geopolitics and volatility in the markets continue to impact Ontario farmers and the important work that they do. For our fam farmers to succeed, they need to know that the government will supply them with the investments that they need to improve their productivity, competitiveness and resilience. Our farmers and agri-food partners expect governments of all stripes and of all levels to work together to ensure that Ontario remains a leader in food production and food security. Speaker, could the minister please explain what measures this government is taking to support this crucial sector? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Niagara West for his question. I want to assure everyone listening today that the Ontario agri-food sector continues to be a number one priority for our government, and I'm very pleased to share that we created through a federal, provincial, territorial initiative in the fall of 2021 in Guelph, a Guelph statement that provided the framework for a negotiation to realize greater investments through a federal provincial partnership. And the member from Niagara West just witnessed last week a historic signing whereby Minister Bebo, Federal Minister of Agriculture, and myself signed a $1.77 billion agreement to deliver for Ontario's agri-food sector. Programs like the suite of business Response. risk management, stewarding, stewardship initiatives, and investment in strategic priori priorities will be realized because of this historic agreement. The future is bright for Ontario. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Member for Niagara West. Mr. I was very thankful to be able to be a signatory witness to this historic agreement, and it's significant that this agreement was signed in Niagara, one of the most productive and diverse growing regions in the entire country. I'm proud of the contributions that farmers in Niagara and across the rest of this province make to our great province, and I know that we all see and value their hard work and sacrifice. Now, I know this agreement represents a positive uh, measure to support growers and farm families in my riding and in so many across this great province, but our farmers know and our government knows that more can always be done. Ontario has many different agri-food partners and many different producers. Each of these various agricultural groups has unique needs, concerns, and faces different challenges. Speaker, could this new agreement, uh, how will this new agreement benefit and support our various sector partners? Could the minister tell this house? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, this agreement that we signed last week represents a 25 per cent increase over and above the last partnership that we had with the federal government, and it will continue to, wow. to see farmers and our agri-food sector grow forward. It complements the strategy that we introduced last fall, and more importantly, it complements initiatives already in place. For instance, we have a, a ministry advisory committee known as the Soil Action Group that informs how we move forward to ensure that farmers have the tools and best practices available to them to see <laughs> 
yield increase year over year. Moreover, we're introducing initiatives to support innovation and research so our processors, in tandem with the good work of our Ontario farmers, are processing more food, not only Bonds. to satisfy Ontario demand, but demand across Canada and around the world. The future is bright. I am so very proud of how our commodity organizations is, are working with our government here in Ontario to make sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker to the Minister of Health. Last week, I talked to Ms. Golnar Vasanji, who is a constituent of mine. She called me because she suffers debilitating spinal pain, and her pain specialist said, You need surgery. She tells me she's not been able to even get on a waiting list with an orthopedic surgeon. Surgeons tell her they have waiting lists two years long. There's no point in taking her name. Why won't the minister help her and others to avoid this kind of unnecessary suffering? Minister of Health. So I'm happy to work with the member opposite on the specific case file that he's referencing, but you know it's passing strange that as we are talking about Bill 60 and the expansion of community surgical and diagnostic in community, you are asking a question that would actually assist. So by allowing us to expand community and surgical units in community, it will ensure that there is more space and more capacity for the very challenging surgeries that the member opposite speaks of. I am happy to help the individual uh, he's referenced, but I would also like you to seriously take a look at Bill 60 and explain to that constituent why you are opposing here, it. Here. Order. Order. Supplementary question. Well, speaker, the minister knows that if she actually put the money into the hospitals as they are now and opened up OR times, people would be getting the surgery they need now. Order. Ms. Vasanji takes powerful painkillers to deal with her pain. She's frightened she might become addicted to them. She can't get the surgery she needs right now, and what the minister says, she's going to have to wait for this bill to pass. That doesn't help her today. I'll give you her phone number. Will you commit to talking to her personally, helping to address her problem, or explaining why she has to suffer needlessly? Minister of Health. Yeah. So again, I will ask the member opposite why they are concerned about Bill 60 when we are in fact allowing that expansion to happen. And respectfully, we have already done that expansion in our publicly funded hospitals by ensuring in the in the last number of years, over $800 million available to hospitals to make sure that they can spend their OR capacity. But you know what, Speaker? It's not really about the money. It's ensuring that those individuals who are on those wait lists get access to surgery here, quickly here. so that they can go back to their families, back to their community, back to their jobs. We are improving the patient experience by expanding clinical and surgical diagnostic in community. I would hope that the member opposite would support Order. those initiatives. Response. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. 9.6 billion dollars. That is the direct economic benefit of Ontario's green belt. Farming, recreation and tourism create over 177,700 jobs in Ontario's Greenbelt, generating rural economic activity, community prosperity. Greenbelt lands contribute $3.2 billion of ecosystem services, such as flood protection. Those jobs, that GDP, and those benefits are at risk because of the premier scheme to open the Greenbelt for development. All of that harm makes absolutely no sense, Speaker, because the government's own housing task force has clearly stated the Greenbelt farmlands and green space isn't needed to build housing. So, Speaker, Question. why is the Premier risking jobs and prosperity by breaking his promise not to open the Greenbelt for development? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, um, in 2005, a typical Ontario home sold for $263,000. Last year, the average Ontario home sold for $932,000, more than a threefold increase in 17 years. A young family 
even those making a decent income simply can't afford to buy a home that meets their needs and their budget. Our government is committed to fixing that. The Housing Affordability Task Force laid out a roadmap. Uh, the government's made some changes that incense uh, getting affordable housing, nonprofit housing, and attainable housing in the ground. We're going to continue to build off that. But if the member opposite thinks $932,000 is an acceptable status quo uh, to support, he's living in a dream world, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, the housing affordability crisis has gotten worse in the last five years under this government's watch. I want to build more homes in affordable communities. That's why I've introduced Bill 44 and Bill 45 to get rid of exclusionary zoning and to build homes that people can actually afford in communities they can actually afford to live in. The Housing Affordability Task Force has put forward 55 recommendations. The government's failed to follow many of them. As a matter of fact, they're absolutely contradicting one of the most explicit ones, which was to not open the Greenbelt for development. Experienced planners have shown that we already have enough land proved for development to build two million homes. Two million homes, speakers, in communities where people can afford to live. Question. Speaker, sprawl is hugely expensive. So can this premier explain why the government is creating so much risk and harm, opening the green belt for development, making life less affordable for people? And to reply, the premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I just want to set the facts. The member from Guelph has the least amount of housing starts in the entire province. The entire province. He's, he's not for affordable housing. He is not for affordable housing, Mr. Speaker, or he'd be pushing it. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, who was against housing at the University of Guelph? He was shot it down. The council shot it down right on the property, University of Guelph. So guess what, Mr. Speaker? I spoke to a parent, and their kids have to pay $2,500 outside the University of Guelph because there's not enough rental, not enough housing. We have a housing crisis, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to ask the member from Guelph, where are you going to house the 300,000 people that are showing up every single year? He doesn't have a solution. He wants to complain, but I never heard Response. him say a word when the Liberals changed the green belt 17 times. Se <laughs> we'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Great. Our government is taking the lead on making Ontario better for people and businesses by removing unnecessary, redundant, and outdated regulations. Recently, we debated the Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act. It's an important package that proposes 28 changes to improve Ontario's competitiveness, build stronger supply chains, and develop a more resilient agricultural sector. One of the proposed changes in the Act is to allow Ontario to begin the process of permitting carbon capture and storage activities in a phased and responsible manner. Question. This is an important step in helping critical industries transition to a low-carbon economy, creating, supporting, and sustaining jobs across Ontario. Speaker, can the Minister of Red Tape Reduction share some of the economic benefits of moving forward with this important initiative? That's a good question. Minister of Red Tape Reduction. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Newmark Aurora for that important question. As a part of the Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act, our government is proposing amendments to the Oil, Gas and Salt Resources Act to end the provision of carbon capture and storage activities here in the province of Ontario. We know there is a massive economic potential in adopting carbon capture and storage and other low carbon technologies, Mr. Speaker. We also know that some of the other provinces are already taking advantage of the carbon capture and storage technology, which has helped create thousands of new jobs. Speaker, this technology is good for the economy, it is good for the environment, and we need to make sure we're not leaving Ontario businesses behind and we're doing everything we can to support them and make sure that they are competitive at the world Response. stage, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we will always say yes to good Ontario here, jobs. Here. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that excellent answer. I'm excited about the potential of carbon capture and storage right here in Ontario. We know that reducing red tape is an important step in unlocking Ontario's economic potential. Last month, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business released its annual Provincial Red Tape Report Card where they grade each province on their efforts to reduce red tape and regulatory burdens over the last year. Ontario was recognized as a leader in our country in prioritizing red tape reduction with special recognition in the creation of a standalone ministry. Question. While this is encouraging news, we all know that more needs to be done to ensure that we are lifting burdens and removing barriers when it comes to red tape. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please share how government is saving people and businesses time and money by reducing red tape? That's a great Mr. Red Tape Production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for that excellent question once again. This year, Mr. Speaker, Ontario received the highest ever placement in 13-year history of the CFIB Red Tape Report Card, being recognized with the Golden Scissors, the One to Watch for Award for Regulatory Modernization, Permitting and Licensing, Mr. Speaker. It's fair to say that our work to reduce red tape is being noticed across the country. Thanks to our ongoing efforts to reduce red tape, it is saving businesses and consumers time and millions of dollars in savings, Mr. Speaker. Altogether, over half a billion dollars in uh, compliance costs, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, make no mistakes. Under this government, Spons? under the leadership of our Premier, Ontario will always show strong leadership when it comes to reducing red tape and continue to make Ontario more competitive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Should Eshna and her neighbours have problems with their condo? They're cold because their units have not had heat for weeks this winter, and they're unsafe because their building is being broken into and their property manager refuses to improve security. They're also concerned because there is no effective regulator, agency or tribunal that can step in and help them. I believe this has got to change. Premier, this is my question. Can you strengthen and improve the condo tribunal so Ontario condo residents have a place to go when they face issues like these? Good question. Good. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker. Our government takes matters of consumer protections in the condo sector very seriously, and I will never stop, never stop taking necessary action to protect Ontarians across the province. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, my ministry actually did welcome the Auditor General's feedback on Ontario's condo sector and has already begun. Uh, consulting on ways to actively improve and expand condo authority tribunal and its powers. And I had a very fruitful conversation with the, with the member opposite in regards to the tribunal. Uh, we are never stopping our efforts to improve uh, protections for all Ontarian speakers and ensure they have a safe and secure place they Bons. all call home. Thank you. 
The next question, member for London North Centre. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Condo Tribunal is not doing nearly enough to pre protect residents. The Minister of Government Services and Consumer Protection already has the fixes in front of him. They need to be implemented. Oh, I'm sorry. Member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Minister of Government Services and Consumer Protection already has the fixes in front of him. They need to be implemented. The Condo Tribunal is not doing nearly enough to protect residents. My constituent Charlene told me that the board president where she lives unilaterally fired the construction company mid-project and hired his own cousin. Conflict. Now, <laughs> residents have to pay enormous of payments for the lawsuit, the lien, and pay again for construction. <clears throat> They're worried that they're going to be paying more in condo fees than their mortgage. Some are moving out or relying on friends to help with groceries. Premier, will you listen to condo residents like Charlene and strengthen the condo tribunal so that Ontarians have protections? Public and business service delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, actually, we are listening to the residents and we are listening to stakeholders across the province when it comes to the condominium, uh, condominium tribunal authority. Speaker, it is this government actually that is making condo boards fairer and more transparent and improving the lives of hundreds of thousands of Ontarians who call co condo a home. Speaker, we will continue to work with the condo sector to Im implement the changes suggested by the Attorney General and ensure the condo owners across the province are provided with the treatment they expect and deserve. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with our stakeholders and, and work with uh, the recommendations that were provided to us by the Auditor General Response? to make sure that Ontarians deserve and feel good when they are making the biggest purchase of their lives. Thank you. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. One of the most important jobs of government is to preserve and protect the well-being of its citizens, particularly its most vulnerable. And on this fundamental task, there is near universal agreement that this government has failed over and over and over again. My perspective on our health care system is, of course, well known. But I'm equally stunned at the manner in which the Ontario Autism Program has essentially collapsed. Consider this. There are well over 60,000 children waiting for services on the OAP. The OAP waitlist has more than doubled since 2018. And the government has fallen so far behind on its commitments that it has thrown up its hands and stopped reporting on statistics anymore. Families are spending tens of thousands of dollars to access services, selling their assets and putting their lives on hold. Without bringing up hollow promises, can the minister explain to the autism community and Ontarians how the Ontario Autism Program Question. has become such a failure under this government's leadership? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite uh, for the opportunity to clarify the facts. When we formed government, it was very clear that the previous Liberal government had failed to deliver the program needed to support thousands of children and had a fraction of the children that were ever going to receive any support under that previous program. It's why our government immediately doubled the funding to the Ontario Autism Program. It's why our government has five times as many children enrolled and receiving supports than the previous government. Uh, previous Liberal government, and that's why we have created Access OAP with care coordinators who help people navigate through the system, a comprehensive system that we heard from Spons? people they wanted uh, uh, occupational therapy, speech therapy, mental health supports, and we added those in. We've been listening to the autism community. That's why we created a program designed by the autism community. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this government has a very consistent pattern. Promise lots of money only for it to never materialize. The minister can try to revise history if she wants, but the reality is that MCCSS is, fa is failing to meet its own required operating standards. And as I'm going I'm to caution, I'm going to caution the member on his use of language. Continue his question and conclude it. <clears throat> 
MCCSS is failing to meet its own required operating standard and, as per the last FAO report, has underspent by nearly half a billion dollars. In August, only 888 children with autism were registered in court therapies. Many more children can't even get a diagnosis, meaning they can't even join a waiting list. And my LA just texted me a few minutes ago saying we got another question. message from a constituent uh, about how OEP is harming, is harming children. My question, how will the minister resurrect the Ontario Autism Program that is withered under, on the vine under this government? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. That's pretty stunning. That is a stunning commentary from the member opposite, who obviously is lacking information or facts of, of exactly what we're doing. Order. We have expanded. We have expanded the diagnostic hubs. We have created capacity at children's treatment centres that the previous Liberal government never bothered to do because it never provided the funding or the capacity to deliver the services that we are now catching up on because the previous Liberal government never did it. And they were supported by the NDP. Order. And they said no. Order. No budget after budget to the largest expenditure in uh, the Ontario history for children with autism. They said no to the children's treatment centres across Ontario. Yeah. They said no to the Ontario uh, process for Response. the access OAP to provide care navigation yeah, to children's families who were vulnerable and needed support. You said no, no, no. We said yes, yes, yes. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Every year, more than one million Ontario Ontarians experience a mental health or addiction issue. This can have a serious impact on their quality of life and that of everyone around them. Last year, one person died every week from an opioid poisoning in the city of Peterborough. Wow. Unfortunately, services have been unequal and inconsistent with too many gaps in the system. As a result, those who need help are too often unable to find it. Other provinces, such as Alberta, are seeing success by investing in a recovery-oriented system of care. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our Ontario government is approaching treatment and recovery programs for the people of Ontario? That's a good order. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for that question. I know that he's been a tireless advocate for the people of Peterborough Kawartha on this issue, and I want to thank him as well for his work. Alberta is certainly seeing success with their program, and I applaud them for it. We will always look for successful models wherever they can be found and make sure that we incorporate what we know will work here in the province of Ontario. The goal of our government is to provide people with substance use issues, treatment and recovery so that they can live a drug-free life. And to meet these unique needs, our approach is to make unprecedented investments in building a continuum of care that provides low barrier access to critical treatment and recovery facilities. We are also ensuring that naloxone, drug testing Response. facilities, harm reduction and consumption of treatment sites are available across the province. Mr. Speaker, we have a model where we have uh, uh, supports for individuals and it's being funded through. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. The sad reality is that Ontarians are struggling to find the help they need when experiencing a mental health or addictions challenge. Our government made a commitment to do something about it, and I know the minister recognizes that there is no linear path for anyone who needs support, and he's spoken repeatedly about the continuum of care. In Peterborough, we're listening and collaborating with various partners to build a system that meets the needs of the people where they need it and when they need it. Speaker, can the associate minister please elaborate on how our government is providing services to support my community? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, our investments through the Roadmap to Wellness, the Addictions Recovery Fund, Youth Wellness Hubs, Mobile Crisis Intervention Teams, we're building a continuum of care, and particularly in uh, uh, Peterborough Kawartha, we've uh, established the Opioid Response Hub in downtown. We're piloting an innovative non-residential recovery program, Right to Heal, significantly expanding withdrawal management services, and just recently drove two new mobile mental health clinics 
off the parking lot. Perhaps most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we're working with community health providers to add 12 new addiction treatment beds in Peterborough through the Addictions Recovery Fund. But let's be clear, this isn't the end of our work. It's just the beginning, not only in Peterborough, but across the province Response. of Ontario. This government is going to continue working for the people of the province of, of Ontario by expanding and improving our continuum of care. Thank you. Next question. The member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. 60,000 older Canadians are the victims of neglect, financial, psychological, physical, and institutional abuse. Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario works very hard to help older Canadians escape abuse. However, they have not received a funding increase in the 20 years of their existence. So they're working on a shoestring. They've got a lot of volunteers. They are so burnt out. Will the Premier ensure that the Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario organization receives an increase in their annual grant to at least match the rate of inflation. Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member opposite for such an important question. Social isolation is the enemy number one for our seniors. That is why our government has invested in programs to make sure seniors stay fit, healthy, and connected in their communities. To combat social isolation and to fight against the ageism, we have invested over $22 million into more than 1,500 senior community grants. Seniors are the backbone of this province, and we will continue to make Ontario a place where seniors thrive. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. During COVID, when so many seniors experienced extreme isolation, rates of abuse increased by 250 percent. Yet, the government chose this time to actually cut elder abuse prevention's funding. So they went from a budget of 900,000, which is not a lot, considering that they have to, they're supposed to cover the entire province, but they went down to 800,000. That's a very significant cut, and that was during COVID when seniors were isolated and really needed the help. That's really shameful. Will the government live up to its obligations to older Ontarians and increase funding for the important work of preventing elder abuse? Thanks for seniors and accessibility. Thank you again for the question. The pandemic has put significant strain on the lives of seniors in Ontario. That is why we have invested $59 million since 2018 to fund really 300 senior active living centers across the province. They deliver activities, programs that keep senior active and socially connected. Through our senior fairs, we are helping seniors connect a local organization and each other all across Ontario. These are a few of the ways we are fighting social isolation and helping Spons. seniors stay healthy, active, Earth. and socially connected. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oakville North, Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Sadly, gender-based violence and domestic violence continue to endanger the safety of many women in our province. No woman should be subjected to violence in any form. Everyone deserves the right to be supported and feel safe in their homes and in their communities. It is crucial that those affected by violence and exploitation receive the supports they need while offenders are held accountable through the justice system. I know that our government is breaking down barriers so women who have experienced violence can receive the help they need, no matter where they are in the province. Responding to this issue must remain a priority. Question. Speaker, can the minister describe our government's ongoing commitment to end violence against women? 
Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Oakville, North Burlington, for that important question. Everyone has the right to live in safety and with dignity, free from intimidation and the threat of violence. It's that simple. We're building on that ongoing work to support women and survivors of gender-based violence and connect them to needed services and supports with $8 million in additional funding over the next four years for dedicated provincial crisis lines to help more women get the help they need when and where they need it most. This investment is in cooperation with the federal government as part of the National Action Plan to end gender-based violence. We are grateful for the federal government's partnership as we build capacity to support survivors, and we look forward to continuing to work together to eliminate violence against women. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. I know that all members of this Legislature agree that every woman has the right to live in safety and with dignity, free from intimidation, coercion, and the threat of violence. What is needed now is timely intervention and access to a variety of supports to help women who are at risk where and when they need it. The government must ensure we are supporting survivors who are escaping violent situations and providing them with the supports they need to enable them to start new lives with futures free from abuse and free from fear. Speaker, can the minister please explain how investments made by our government will lead to tangible outcomes for women across our province who are experiencing violence? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again. These crisis lines are free, confidential, and available 24-7 to help ensure those affected by violence or sexual exploitation can access supports they need anywhere, anytime. In addition to 24-hour crisis counselling, the lines offer triage support, such as referrals to women's shelters and specialized programming to help survivors rebuild their lives and heal from trauma. This investment supports multiple organizations, including the Assaulted Women's Helpline, which provides services in over 200 languages, FemAid, which offers crisis counselling and referral services for Francophone and French-speaking women, Talk for Healing, which provides culturally responsive services for Indigenous women and their families in urban, rural, remote and First Nations communities. Working together, we can end violence against women, and we're going to continue towards this important goal. Thank you. The member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, more than 65,000 people in the London area do not have a family doctor, including almost one quarter of the patients who go to St. Joseph's Hospital Urgent Care, a significant increase since just last year. Rukaya lives in London West, and she has been listed with Healthcare Connect for almost two years. She was diagnosed with cancer after an ER visit last year and was treated with surgery. Without a family doctor, she has no choice but to keep going to the ER for all monitoring and follow-up care. Speaker, whatever this government is doing is not working. How much longer do Londoners have to wait before they will be able to find a family doctor? Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, I hope the member opposite has received a copy of the Your Health document that has been circulated to all MPPs because it actually highlights in that document exactly the expansion Order. that we have in the world to expand the number of family health uh, practitioners Opposition and primary order. care practitioners practicing in the province of Ontario. In fact, since government our government order. formed government, we have had over 1,800 new family docs practice in the province of Ontario. Of course, we also have two, not one, two new medical schools that are being built. And in fact, in Brampton alone, we are going to have new family docs who are registered and practicing their study, starting to practice their study Spons. in September of 2024, because we were able to work with a partnership with the city of Brampton to find an existing building, renovate it, and get those students um, in training as quickly as possible. I'm proud of the work that we're doing. Supplementary, once again, member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. Katerina Alexander-Wills also lives in London West. She's been looking for a family doctor for four years, so long that her Healthcare Connect listing expired and had to be resubmitted. She hasn't had a physical in almost 10 years, despite her family history of medical concerns. Mo Alajidi is a nurse and has been looking for a doctor for her family since she moved to London in September 2021. Another constituent emailed me on Friday. She's pregnant and needs regular care. Speaker, does this Premier understand that forcing people to go to urgent care or the ER after a serious problem develops is not only costly to the system, but bad for patient health? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite is highlighting exactly why we as a government have made these investments since 2018. And in fact, if you would review the Your Health document, I hope you share it with co those con constituents, you will see that our expansion for primary care model has already happened. And in, in fact, in the city of uh, Lake Hamilton, Haldeman, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, as well as uh, Minister Todd Smith's writing, we have expanded primary care and nurse-led practitioner clinics because we understand that they are a model that is working very effectively and ensuring that the people of Ontario have access to a primary care physician when they need it. We are continuing to do that work. We are continuing with those expansions of primary care, nurse-led practitioner clinics, and working with our partners to make sure that we have all Stop the clock for a second. The member for Brampton North and the member for Waterloo, if they wish to have a conversation. We're in the midst of question period. And we still have a few seconds. So we'll start the clock again. The member for Peterborough Court. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Great Minister. Our government has, is building a province where all women and girls are empowered to succeed. That starts with getting more women into jobs than ever before. Women entrepreneurs are essential to our province's economic success, accounting for nearly 20% of all small and medium-sized businesses in Ontario. I was proud to join the Associate Minister at a roundtable hosted by the Peterborough Chamber of Commerce. We had the opportunity to hear from many women leaders in my community. From our discussion, many women identified that they continue to experience challenges barriers and red tape in starting and scaling up their businesses. Speaker, what actions is our government taking to support the advancement of economic opportunity for women in our province? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was thrilled to be in Peterborough recently with the member, and we had a great opportunity to engage with local businesses and join a roundtable with the Peterborough Chamber of Commerce. We heard firsthand accounts of some of the many unique and disproportionate economic barriers women face when starting or scaling up their businesses. That's why our government is taking a multi-pronged approach to unlock more opportunities for women in the modern post-pandemic economy. We are supporting women as they enter and re-enter the workforce with programs like the Investing in Women's Future program and the Women's Economic Security programs. And we are opening opportunities for women to pursue entrepreneurship as a flexible career path with the Regional Innovation Centre and Small Business Enterprise Networks. We are breaking barriers, helping businesses grow, and get it, getting it done because Response. we believe that when women succeed, Ontario yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our question period for this morning. The Minister